right. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Great to be in worship. Good to see you all. Uh, of course, we have our, our Church Under the Bridge team has been hard at work, and they're uh, tending to our homeless uh, clients, so uh, we, we will be sure to pray for them today and wish them well. Uh, but uh, let's begin our time here with uh, some announcements. I'd like to let you know that, uh, you know, school is starting back very early this year. Uh, August 10th will be the first day that the kids are back in school. So we're kind of going to be moving up all of our normal activities around the schools to match uh, the start date of the, uh, ba- of, you know, the school calendar. So August 7th, will be our back to school Sunday. That'll be when we do the blessing of the backpacks. Uh, and so if you know somebody who's going to school, uh, tell them to come. We're going to say a blessing over you know, school supplies and over all the kids. We're going to pray for uh, the uh, teachers and the administrators. We'll, just, we'll blanket our schools in prayer uh, on that day, August 7th. So know that'll be our, our uh, back to school Sunday. We'll also be giving out third grade Bibles on that day as well. So uh, again, a little earlier than normal. And then uh, uh, also in that, that uh, uh, vein, the uh, Wednesday night uh, activities is going to start back on August 24th. So again, that will be early too. And we'll have, a, uh, they've got a new name for that. I'm, I'm not sure if they're ready to release that, but we're going to call it something different than uh, uh, what we've been calling it. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that soon too. Uh, we are uh, starting our school supply drive. I see uh, several uh, uh, donations of school supplies out there. If you'd like to bring those uh, to worship with you on Sunday mornings, feel free to do so and just drop them there. If you'd like to give monetarily, just mark your gift uh, school supplies, and then we'll use that to buy supplies then to hand out as well. Uh, Art Camp, which will be our follow-up to our Vacation Bible School, will be August 2nd through the 4th. It'll be an evening kind of uh, uh, experience for our kiddos aged 9 to 16. Uh, there'll be art supply, or art projects that they will be doing. Uh, they'll be held in the student center, and it'll be from 5.30 to 7.30, and there will be a meal provided uh, each of those uh, evenings for that. So uh, those are the things that are going on. We're starting to get busy, yes, and Ray is reminding me uh, that we are uh, uh, going to With COVID, as bad as it is, you'll hear during our prayer time that we have probably 10 or or 12 uh, members who currently have COVID. Uh, Others who have been past it over the last several weeks, we're going to begin recommending, it's not a requirement, but we're going to recommend that folks start wearing masks again while we're here together on Sunday mornings. Uh, Just the numbers are going crazy. This strain of COVID is more contagious. Uh, than any of the other ones, you can you can get it very easily. So we're gonna we're gonna go back into a recommended mask uh, policy, uh, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, you know, I haven't I've gotten out of the use out of the habit of wearing my mask, so I didn't have one in my pocket today. But I'll start. I'm gonna get back into that and start carrying that again as well. Uh, but all right. So these are all of the uh, announcements that I have for us today. So let's begin our time of worship with a prayer. Would you pray with me? O oh, great and gracious God, as we come together today, Lord, we ask that you be with us, that you fill our hearts, that you open our minds to the words that you would be speaking to us. Lord, help us to receive your word, help us to know of your grace, and help us, O oh Lord, to share it with everyone that we meet. O oh Lord, these things we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now I'd invite you to stand as we join together in, O oh Jesus, I have promised. I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the But Jesus, draw thou nearer, 
and shield my soul from sin. Oh, let me hear thee speaking in accents clear and still. Of all the storms of passion, the murmurs of self-will. Oh, speak to reassure Speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. O Jesus, thou hast promised to all who follow thee, that where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. Follow you all 
Thank you so much. You may be seated, everyone. And next, I'd like to invite Judy to come up and to lead us in prayer. Okay, good morning. We're going to start with some praises. This is apparently July is a big birthday month. So Tawny is celebrating her birthday tomorrow, correct? Happy birthday. I didn't know this, but she and I are birthday twins. My birthday is also tomorrow. Hermie's birthday is uh, Tuesday. Uh, Sharon Curry celebrated a birthday. So we have, we have birthday celebrations, so we are grateful for that. And then Joey, the Miller's grandson, had successful surgery. So those, those joys and those praises, so thank you, Lord. And then we have, we have these from our congregation that are dealing with COVID. I'll lift, lift up all these names and then we'll have our response. But these are the ones that I've heard of. There may be others. For Jackie, for Kathy, for Les and Debbie, for Abel and Anna Lee, for Sharon Lee. Those are the ones that I have heard of. Do you all know of any others from our con congregation that are dealing with COVID right now? So we lift up these for healing. So Lord, hear our prayers. For the Campbells, for Cindy as she recovers from uh, surgery and Doug comes home tomorrow from rehab. So Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, for Jan, leader has, oh, here's, she has COVID and she had hip surgery. So Lord, hear our prayers. And then these are from our community prayer board. Prayers for a liver transplant for Terry. Lord, hear our prayers. And prayers for Angelina as she waits for back and knee surgery. Lord, hear our prayers. And now let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful for this time during worship when we can sit for a while, when we can share our joys and we can share our concerns with you, the God of the universe, the God who is for us, not against us, the God who encircles us with your love and your mercy and, and grace. And so, Father, we thank you for these birthday celebrations, for family celebrations that will happen. We are grateful. We thank you for, for good results from surgery. We are grateful. And Father, we thank you for those from our congregation this very minute that are preparing food and will go down to feed the homeless. Father, we are grateful. Grateful that they have heard that call from you. Grateful that they will be your hands and feet. And we pray a blessing over those that will receive that meal today. Father, I lift up those that are living on the streets and dealing with this oppressive, oppressive heat. Father, we pray for some rain. We pray for some relief from these triple digits. And we are grateful for those that have delivered window units and fans. So Father, we lift up those that are having to deal with, with this heat this summer. Father, we've lifted up many, many who need healing from COVID. We have friends that need healing from surgeries. We have those that are dealing with dementia. And Father, we pray for wisdom for the doctors, steady hand for surgeries. We're grateful for treatment plans. Father, you know those that are on our hearts this day. And Father, we know that there are those that we love and care for that deal with depression and anxiety, with hopelessness and struggle to make ends meet. Father, we know that there are those that we love who feel far, far away from you this day, but we know that you are a God who loves each one of us, a God who has a plan for us, a plan for our welfare, to give us a future and a hope. And so, Father, we pray for these that 
struggle to, to know you, that they would grow in their knowledge and understanding of your love for them, and that you would use us. Help us to always be ready to give an account for the hope that is in us. Help us to know our story, to tell it with the boldness, but with respect and gentleness, so that we might be people of hope, and love your Easter people, the light you call us to be. Father, we're grateful for Arts Camp to come. I just pray a blessing over Tiffany and the volunteers that you will raise up. I pray for those children that will come and those young adults that will come to, to using gifts of art and music and other ways will come to know more about you. Pray a blessing over our day school and we pray for those teachers and staff and children protection for them from this COVID. And Father, we lift up our children that are preparing to go back to school early. We lift up our teachers that are already at work preparing their classrooms and going to in services. And we know we have three schools right here around us. Help us to be a witness to them. I just pray that this foyer will be overflowing with school supplies that we can deliver over to Regency. And Father, we know that there are other ways that you will use us this week. You use us through the prayers on that community board. And so we lift up those that we've spoken out loud today. They must know we are a praying church. And I would pray they would find their way into this sanctuary someday and that we would be welcoming. And it would be a place for them to join in our community. So listen to these prayers that we've spoken out loud and those that we just murmur in the depths of our heart. We lift them up to you, you who can do far more beyond anything we could ever even imagine or ask. Listen to your children praying as we use these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our next uh, uh, song is going to be a hymn uh, called Hope of the World. And, uh, and our prophet today that we'll be hearing about in our message is going to be Georgia Harkness. And she is the author of this hymn and a couple other things that are in the hymnal as well. So I'd like uh, to ask you to, to turn your attention to our music team as they present Hope of the World. Hope of the world, the Christ of great compassion, speak to our fearful hearts by conflict rent. Save us, thy people, from consuming passion, who by our own false hopes and dreams are spent. Hope of the world, God's gift from highest heaven, Away from 
from thee to endless night. Hope of a world who by thy cross did save us from death and our despair, from sin and guilt. We And use them as thou wilt. O of the world, O Christ, O death victorious, who by this sign did conquer grief and sin, we would be. To thy gospel glorious, thou art our Lord, thou dost forever reign. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. So now as we come to this time of offering, let me remind you that there are several ways that you can uh, give either by uh, mail by our, uh, to the church office or through our website, also through the box that is by the back doors of the, of the uh, sanctuary today. But now in whatever way those gifts are made, let us pause to ask a blessing upon this giving. O oh, great and gracious God, uh, you have given to us everything that we know and everything that we own. O oh, Lord, help us as we return just a portion of you. Help us to, to know that you are the source of all good things. Help us to know that you have blessed us and that that blessing is meant for us and for uh, the world that surrounds us. Lord, bless these gifts that we return to you. Bless each of those who will give and bless each of those who will receive from this offering so that we all may come to know you, so that we all may come to understand your grace and to know the world uh, and the kingdom that you have created. Oh Lord, these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now let me invite Sandy to come up to read our scripture for today. Today's scripture is found on page 597 of your Pew Bibles and also page 594. Will you join me in the prayer of illumination? Lord, Open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you just say to us today. Amen. If you'll stand as you are able, please. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth and with it said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. 
The second scripture is from Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate from min for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Here endeth the reading and the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you, Sandy, for reading for us today. So we're going to continue in the sermon series uh, that is about prophets. Uh, we've been following this throughout the summertime, and I've been pairing a modern-day prophet with a biblical prophet. And my, my hope is that, my goal is that we will learn uh, how to recognize a prophet and how to tell the difference between a prophet and a, a false prophet and how to know that, that we too have that task of prophecy that is speaking the word of God. Uh, in, our, in the image that I've been using as the theme image, we see the stained glass that depicts this passage that was read from Isaiah 6. We see Isaiah there and the, the seraph the, uh, holding the coal to his lips. We'll talk more about that in just a few moments. Um, Georgia Harkness is a name that I, uh, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard. Uh, it's not a very common name, not very uh, many people know her, but she is, in this series, she's the only person I've chosen who is a Methodist uh, to lift up as the modern day prophet. Um, and since she is a Methodist, I looked on the Methodist sites, found where the Methodist church has created a little uh, biographical video of her, so I'd like to present uh, that video to you as we get started now. Born in 1891 and ordained decades before women were given full clergy rights in her church, this Methodist pioneer persisted. Told she could not attend the all-male Boston University School of Theology, she instead earned a PhD and then became the first woman to teach theology in an American seminary. Georgia Harkness went on to write 37 books. In her time, Harkness notoriously confronted Karl Barth himself on his theology of female subordination. But she also inspired famous faith leaders like the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. I had the great privilege of reading some of your books and articles. I've long admired your Christian witness and your sound theology. Harkness's words and her witness of faith left an unmistakable mark on Methodism and the world, according to the head of the church's archives agency. She grew to be a pronounced denouncer of racism and unbridled capitalism and the internment of Japanese Americans in internment camps during the Second World War, a great defender of women's rights, a promoter of women's ordination, and um, uh, an ecumenist in a you know, 60 or 70 year career as probably the most pronounced female theologian of her time. Hers was once a household name, and Harkness's books have been favorites of seminarians present and past, like the Reverend Hero Park. Because I studied the practical theology, um, the fact that she was a scholar and activist uh, in the church as a woman was very impressive to me. In 2016, the United Methodist Publishing House in Nashville, Tennessee, named their library for the woman who taught theology in words any church member could understand. Brian Milford is chief executive there. It matters more today than ever. 
The church is called of God to make a difference in the world. And Georgia Hartness helped us understand how we serve that vocation, how we respond to God's call in our life to make a difference in the world. Her hymns and prayers are staples in the United Methodist Hymnal. In 1953, she penned the song, Hope of the World. She also continues to leave a mark on education. A Georgia Harkness scholarship is offered for women seeking a second career in ordained ministry. Students at Garrett Evangelical, where Harkness taught for 11 years, graduate in red shoes as a tribute, stepping out to serve in the footsteps of Georgia Harkness. So whenever we as a clergy women get discouraged due to isms of the world, we should remember her daring faith in Jesus Christ. Pick up a book by Georgia Harkness and read it. It will change your life. So in my putting together this message today, I looked around, I wanted to find uh, a bunch of different pictures. I can only find two pictures of Georgia Harkness uh, anywhere, and they were the two that were in the, in the video, and they'll be the only two that I find here. I find that interesting that I wasn't able to find more uh, that are out in the public sphere anyway. Uh, but there's, there's a picture of Georgia. She was born in 1891, died in 1974, went to Cornell to get her uh, undergraduate degree, and then tried to get into seminary, but was not allowed. Uh, you know, she had the wrong chromosomes uh, to get in. Uh, she was recognized by everyone who surrounded her as being called by God. She was articulate. She was uh, driven. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. She was sound in her, her theology and in her beliefs. She was uh, incredibly smart and just had a heart for God, but she was not allowed to go to seminary. Uh, she did instead, as the video said, went and got her master's and her PhD uh, at Boston University. Um, she went on to, to then teach, and she taught at several different uh, universities, including Garrett, uh, at the time was called Garrett Biblical Institute, now Garrett Evangelical, uh, the place where they still honor her uh, by wearing red shoes, the women who graduate from there. Uh, but she also taught uh, at the uh, Pacific School of Theology. And she insisted that her title be Professor of Applied Theology. Uh, applied Theology is, is what you do, what all of us do when we read something in Scripture or learn something about God and then apply it to the real world. I mean, it's nice to have some trivia so that we can win Trivial Pursuit every once in a while. But it's only when we apply the stuff that we learn to our lives, we try to plug it into real life, that it really begins to make a difference. And, re and that's what she was good at, and that's what she concentrated on. She was wicked smart. She knew theology up one side and down the other and could hold her own with any theologian of the time, and they talked about Karl Barth. Uh, but it wasn't just knowing that stuff, it was her way of applying it and her way of bringing it down to where, where anybody could understand what she was saying and understand the significance and the greatness of God that made her special. Now, she wasn't an author. We, we heard her uh, in the video that she has written 37 books in her time. She was a very articulate speaker. Her, her list of speaking engagements was a mile long. People wanted her to come because she was so good at conveying the good news about talking about God. She was also a poet. She was filled with energy and was passionate. It was just somebody that people flocked to to hear what she would have to say. Um, and she was the first woman in a lot of different uh, areas within religion. She was the first member of the American Theological Society, first full-time woman professor of the theological studies at any American seminary. She was the first woman theologian to be part of the worldwide Protestant ecumenical circle, which later changed its name to the World Council of Churches. She was passionate about God. 
and she was passionate about connecting with others and she didn't care if they spoke the Methodist language or the, used the Methodist tradition of naming God and, and following God. She said all people who followed God could work together. And so she, one of her big works was, was in the ecumenical field in bringing different uh, people together. One of the constant themes due to her own call that could not be lived out, the call to, to be a pastor, uh, one of her constant themes was to work uh, toward the status of women and to improve that status in the way that culture uh, treated women at the time. She was ordained in 26 and then uh, as, a, as a deacon in 26 and then as an elder in 38, we, we've changed our system. We don't ordain in the same way. Uh, today as they did then, but she was denied membership in a conference, which means she, she could not be a pastor. She was ordained but could not pastor a church, could not follow the call that she had been called to. Um, everybody that surrounded her confirmed that call. Everyone that surrounded her could see clearly the Holy Spirit at work within her, could see the gifts that God had given to her and confirm that call every step of the way, but the rules were the rules uh, at the time, and she could not follow that call. So she dedicated her life then to, to changing those rules so that other women could carry out their call and could serve God in the way that God had called them. Uh, in 1956, um, the Methodist church that she was a part of had their global kind of kind of meeting. Today we call it General Conference. I think that word came about in 68. I don't think it was actually called the General Conference in 56. But it was a huge meeting where, where the, the, the rules were discussed and had the potential to be changed. And it was at the 56 conference then, the 56 meeting, when that rule did get changed. And women could be full in their fully... Uh, made as a pastor, uh, could be made full, given full pastoral status. And everybody at the conference, these were, this was a huge meeting, but everybody at the conference knew who was responsible for bringing up the, the, the issues at hand and speaking so articulately and passionate about them. And so after the, the vote was taken and the rule was changed, everybody stood up and gave Georgia a round of applause. Everybody recognized it was because of her work, because of her advocacy, because of her passion, because of her gifts that that rule could be changed and that women could be ordained and be full leaders in the Methodist church. She applied theology to everything, every question of the day that would come up. She, she worked against uh, systemic greed. She worked for peace. She worked against racism. She worked for church universal is what I called it here, the ecumenical movement of, of saying that just because you weren't born in the Methodist tradition or weren't raised in the Methodist tradition, the God that you love is the same that is loved in the Baptist tradition or in the Lutheran tradition or any of the others. She was one to work for the inclusion of all. And here's something that was unique in her teachings and the way that she applied theology. She was among the first of those who said uh, that the calling of, uh, of all, uh, that our work to interpret and to do ministry is the work of all people and not just the clergy. If you hold in your set of beliefs that all people are called to ministry more than just the clergy person who stands up in front on Sunday morning, if it's in your belief system that, that all people are called to ministry, thank Georgia Harkness. She is why you believe that today. She's had profound uh, impacts on the way that we study and the way that we, we worship and the things that we believe. And it was her passion that brought that and her, her, uh, all of her gifts that brought that to us even today. So now let's skip over to Isaiah. Let's see how Georgia and Isaiah kind of fit hand in hand in the way that they work. 
Isaiah is standing there in the throne room in this passage, one of the the great passages. I I love to read it because it's such a vivid kind of picture that gets drawn in your mind of the throne room of God and all of God's magnificence and the the smoke from the incense is, is filling the room and the seraphs are there attending to God's needs and doing the work of God. And Isaiah stands before God in all of his glory and Isaiah feels little. I can imagine that. I can imagine being, being in just complete awe and wonder and just being, being made to feel little in the presence of the glorious God. And I can even imagine the feelings that Isaiah had as he said, why am I allowed to be here? I'm an unclean man with unclean lips. I come from a, a community of unclean people and yet... I have been blessed to be here in the throne room before the glory of God. He said those words, and the seraph brings a live ember from the, from the pits where the incense is being burned. The seraph brings that coal, touches them to the lips that were unclean, and then says, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. Isaiah didn't make himself clean. God made him clean. And he made him able to stand there in the throne room to soak in the glory of God. And then, the amazement that Isaiah had can be seen when God follows that up by saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us to do our work? And Isaiah hears himself saying, here am I, send me. I think this is a pattern of faith. I think once we, once we begin to understand the glory of God, once we begin to know the love of God and how it's meant for even me, even any one of us, that, that feeling of guilt, it's easy to, to imagine how that comes on. Being in the presence of someone so awesome, so glorious, and then knowing our own sins, and knowing our own past, and knowing our own weaknesses, and knowing our own defeats. And once we know those things, knowing that they are forgiven, that they are washed away, and that God wants us in that presence wants us in that throne room. It's that love that we can then breathe into our nostrils. That spirit of grace that then overwhelms us if we understand grace maybe for the first time in our lives. It's that that makes us say, God, I want to be on your team. God, send me to do your work. God, send me out into the the world where other people with unclean lips and unclean hearts where they live and help me to share your glory. This was part of Georgia's experience growing up. She knew God. She was a dedicated disciple of God, trying her best to live out her life and the way that God led her ran into rules decided to change the rules and did with God's help God gifted her with the vision God gifted her with an applied theology that then applied to the way the systems that were in place at the time and taught the way that they should be gave her the ability to say those things and to be in the right places And to convince others. When she said, here I am, send me. She was telling us, we can raise our hands too. Doesn't matter if you're male or female, black, white, something in between. Doesn't matter. God's love is for all. 
she would say, it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Catholic or a Lutheran or any of the other denominations that are out there. There is one God that we all love. There is one God who loves us all. Let us work together. Let us be together. Let us raise our hands in unison and say, send me. Everybody that I give them the scripture to today has asked me, so are you sure you want to do six? Read chapter six before we read chapter two? And so I've had to, to ease everyone's concerns that yes, we're reading them out of order. Chapter six is where the call of Isaiah is. Chapter two is where the, 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 the view, the dream of Isaiah is. His dream was that God would call everyone to the holy mountain. Call everyone to God's presence where he would teach his ways. And where as people left that holy mountain, they would walk in his path. I love this statue. It's, at the, it's part of the UN uh, art collection. And as you can see, there's a man holding a hammer that and holding a sword that he is beating into, the bottom of the sword is a plowshare. See, when, we, when God teaches us his ways, and we follow in his path, then a society, a culture is produced where all of the hurts go away, where war is no more, where injustice is no more, where... Division is no more. Where weapons of war are converted into weapons of agriculture so that all may benefit. This was the dream. This is the how to, how to get there. If we're taught his ways, we follow his path we too can find that sense of peace that can only come from him. But it means that we have to work in applying our theology and applying what we learn to live in those ways. You know, it's one thing to, to gather bits of information. About, well, you know, I've, I've learned this and I've learned this over here and I can win any trivial pursuit game that I ever play. That doesn't mean anything if you're not applying those things that you've learned about God. It doesn't mean anything unless you're living the life that God has called us to. It doesn't mean anything unless you're advocating for those who are, who are pushed aside, who are not able to live out the life that God has called them to. It doesn't mean a thing unless it's being lived out. This was the call of Georgia. This was the work that Georgia taught the world and has given to, to you today. She says in her book, Religious Giving, the social struggle to create a more Christian world, if taken seriously, will lead you into ways of unpopularity and loneliness when only the person whose life is grounded in God finds the power to stand. She's talking about her journey. She's talking about anyone's journey who may decide to begin to follow the ways of God. That is not going to be easy. But God gives us the strength. It's God who gives us the boldness. It's God who gives us the gifts to carry that out. Here's one of the poems that Georgia wrote. God gave Isaiah... Then the vision high. His unclean lips were purged with sacred fire. Out of the smoke a voice and challenge came. Unhesitant he answered, here am I. Again, the days are dark, the outlook dire. Lord, touch thy prophets now with holy flame. She's saying, Isaiah lived, prophesied in his time. Georgia lived prophesied in her time. Now is our time. Now, just like then, we require the forgiveness of God, 
to know the grace and the glory of God. And then that builds us up and gives us the energy and gives us a message then to give to the world as we speak God's words. As we become prophets. As we lean into the grace that God has given to us all. And I pray that we will. Amen. Now let me invite any of you who wish to join the church to come forward as we sing our final song, We Cry Out. Would you please stand as we join together? Visitors, we like to give a little gift to say welcome. Hope that you've had an enjoyable day. Here's one for you too. You're welcome. You're welcome. So now as we prepare to leave this place, as those who will speak the word of God, go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon each of you and bring you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.